<laughs> what I wanted to do was to share with you an exploration I did a few years ago. Um, and uh, it was triggered by a show at the Fugard in September 2010 called Bambi Kellerman at the Fugard. I don't know if any of you saw that. You saw it. Yeah, I, I, if my memory is not right about it, keep quiet, don't spoil my story. Okay? <laughs> um, uh, the advert said the cabaret is not for the faint hearted. It unites the acrid stench of the old Weimar Republic of the 30s and the sexy rot of Hamburg's Reeperbahn with the familiar aromas of Wurtrecker camps and Dreifle orgies. <laughs> and it was given by um, Bambi Kellerman, this German woman, who was the wicked sister of the rather better known Tania Vita. <laughs> and um, it was a classic bit of Peter Der case, you know, this charming woman giving her life story in Germany and that, but you know, reading between the lines, it was dead obvious she'd been an out and out Nazi sympathizer, you know, and, and um, sort of groupy. And, fled from Germany in 1945 to come to, um, uh, come to South Africa as a safe hidey hole, you know. So that was the sort of the story behind the story. But the thing I went away from that took that show um, was what he told me about the Weimar Republic. So much, I was so struck by it that I, you know, when I got back, I quickly immediately looked up Wikipedia and um, Google to find out, you know, and, what she said was seemed to be so. I, of course, have heard of the Weimar Republic, as everyone has. So, wasn't it that rather sort of feeble government that um, Germany had after the First World War that didn't stick up for the German people in the Treaty of Versailles, you know, and then totally mismanaged the economy and they had hyperinflation, and more or less created a sort of vacuum into which Hitler and Nazism marched in? That's the sort of you know, if you ask me about it, that's what I thought. What I hadn't realised was just what a revolutionary government it was. But um, it, it began um, was had its beginnings in a sort of you know a, a Russian Revolution style revolt of sailors and, and workers, things like that. And it was a real attempt to bring in. Um, well, it, it got rid of um, Kaiser Wilhelm. Um, you know, the, the old uh, uh, monarchy going for decades out, and in came this new um, government, this republic. And it incorporated, you know, trade unionists, socialists, liberals, I even think some right-wing elements, but all people who felt that there was going to be a new start, something new was going to be created. And um, it was strongly socialist, egalitarian, and idealistic. Now, when this was being described, this one word popped up into my mind, Uranian. You know, this to me is the epitome of Uranus. There's high ideals, get rid of the old, smash it, get rid of it. Um, a new start, a fresh start, modern um, thinking people. You can just imagine all the um, meetings they held, you know, and taking votes and things like that, and all trying to reach a consensus. It's that sort of setup. The word Uranian. Um, Uranus, I soaked with iconoclasm, idealism, revolution, and uh, sort of uh, intellectualism, what would we call it? Um, rationalism, I think, is a way. All these qualities, um, some are contained in the image of Uranus. It's like an archetype, a very complex archetype. Now, of course, thinking about Uranus, the question of new planets came into my mind. And there's this question of, do we really need new planets? Um, some people prefer to go back to traditional astrology and not include Uranus, Neptune, and um, Pluto. My own attitude is sort of fairly ambivalent on this because I think now we hear so many new bodies being discovered in the solar system, you know, copper belts and asteroids and other sort of things, and centaurs, and um, I'm rather tired of it. Uh, see, if I look at my chart, um, 
including, if I include, even if I add Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, I get that. And I can handle that level of complexity. You know, there's a lot in there, mm -hmm. and you can add some midpoints, things like that. But I, if I just add five asteroids, it does that. I can't, I can't. You know, talk about 21st century information overload. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't like that. And so my attitude is that, you know, fair enough if you've got Ceres bang on your ascendant, or very, some, it's very important in your chart. It's reasonable to look at the cycles and see if they add anything. Otherwise, I don't myself bother with looking at all these minor planets and asteroids. But these three outer planets have featured quite significantly in my, um, in, as transits in my chart, and they are very meaningful to me. But to see just how revolutionary Uranus was, I'd like to go back to before it was discovered. And we're not just going back um, before the days of computer horoscopes you know, and calling it up on the screen, but going back before even the days of looking up positions in an ephemeris. The origins of astrology were looking at the sky. And if you look at the sky at night, you realize there's a lot of fixed stars that stay the same and never seem to move. And amongst them, there are one or two that move. And the most obvious thing that hits you when you look at the sky is that there's the sun and the moon. And um, these are so easily, in our culture, they're seen as to represent the father and the mother. There's a lot of symbolism that makes that appropriate. And I think most cultures associate the sun with um, the male masculine side and the moon with the feminine. Certainly ours does. And but if you start thinking in those terms, you notice there's a tiny planet which never goes far from father, scampering around. And that represents childhood, you know, the infant running around, family. And Mercury um, is the name of that planet. There's another planet which stays in the family, and that is Venus. Um, a beautiful planet which actually has phase changes like the moon if you've got very sharp eyes. Um, and so it tends to have a, a, a feminine association. But the point is, it's, um, as it stays in the family, it's like uh, in Shakespeare's Ages of Man, he's talking about the lover. This is the dreamy adolescent um, falling in love and that sort of thing. And so that phase of life is represented there. The next phase is when they leave the family. Mars is red and it goes all over the chart, all over the zodiac. It doesn't, it doesn't stick with the sun and the moon. And it's the mo most erratic motion of all. And that's a natural for the warrior phase of life. When you go out into the world to carve your career or whatever. And um, the stage after that, Jupiter, another big, grand, shining planet. And if you've got sharp eyes, you can see it's got its own family. You can see three or four little um, moons around it. A natural symbol for the mature adult who's reached the peak of their success. And there's one left, a dim planet, Saturn, which also fades, and, um, but not in the same way, not as a crescent, but it's just the tilting of the, of the, um, of the rings makes it waver like that. And it's slow and it represents old age and the preparation for death. Now, that's the complete span of the human. And also we have the male and the female um, of the, the sun and the moon. And each of these reflects that in a sort of like what can you see it's going up. Um, for, for male Mercury we have Gemini, and we have Virgo for the um, female Mercury. Then for Venus, we have Taurus, and we have Libra, for the male and female of that age. For Mars, we have Aries, and we have Scorpio. And for Jupiter, we have Pisces for the feminine, and we have Sagittarius 
for masculine and for Saturn we have um, Capricorn and we have Aquarius. So what you've got there is something perfect and complete. Mm. Every age from birth to death and male and female and the complete cycle of the zodiac. There's no room for anything more in that. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. And yet, on um, 13th of March, 1781, shock, the discovery of another planet. And at that point, the size of the solar system doubled in one day. Because mm -hmm. the, the radius of the orbit of Uranus is twice as far from the sun as Saturn is. So it doubled in those terms. But actually, if you think in terms of area, it was four times as big. Think in terms of volume, it's now eight times as big. So the system just blew up like that. Um, but this is a complete thing here. You know, there's no room for it. So it was a shattering of a perfect whole. Now, what astrologers do in the face of that is two things. One is you look at the sort of mythological symbolism of the name that's been given to that planet, um, which is a bit of a sort of looking back after the event thing. The other is you look at what happens when it's discovered. Now that year um, was the time of the French Revolution and there was a revolution in America. We had this heady mix of idealism and a destruction of the old. And it was I mentioned those two countries, but it was something that was just rushing through society at the time. Everywhere was uh, influenced by this. In England, you're either delighted by it, thrilled by it, the prospect of a new world, or else terrified. You know, everything you stand for um, is going to be shattered. There was fear and there was excitement. Um, this mixture of idealism and destruction. It was also the time when electricity was being discovered. Benjamin Franklin had sent up a, um, a kite into a thunderstorm and he'd shown what people had long thought was the anger of the gods was actually electricity up there. So there's that rationalism about it. And um, so how do we cope with that? This, this archetype of, of new things um, coming together, this complex archetype. Well, in a sense, you could say, well, it's nothing's new. Okay, we've got the destruction, breaking of the old world, that's Mars aggression, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, but what about the idealism? Well, that's Jupiter. Yeah, but it's also very rational. Um, yeah, that's Mercury. You see, because the old system is complete, you can actually you know, explain away these new planets. You can say, well, you know, they're just sort of a new collection of um, old things that have always existed. Um, for instance, the idea of revolution. Well, people have always revolted. You know, mm -hmm. Slaves have revolted against their masters. Um, the teenagers, I'm sure cave teenagers, revolted against their parents. <laughs> now, revolt is nothing new. But revolution, in a way, is new. Because it's like a tide that sweeps through um, all of society. Uh, it's got a different feel to it. And that is why they got called the transpersonal planets. Because we're now talking of thing which isn't so much one person saying, I'm, I'm fed up, I'm going to revolt, but a, a wave that goes through society and sweeps along other people in it. This is the sort of thing we look for in the transpersonal planets. Now, the French Revolution was before, was the, the only new planet to discovered was Uranus. We didn't have the other ones. And, um, what was the detail of it? It was a very Uranian revolution. Um, they decided, one of the things that was thrown over, obviously, was the monarchy, but also the Catholic Church. France was a very Catholic country. And they tried to replace it with a church of reason. You know, some of the cathedrals were converted um, to replace Catholicism. Its goal was the perfection of mankind through attainment of truth and liberty. And the guiding principle of this goal was the exercise of reason. In the manner of conventional religion, it encouraged acts of congregational worship and devotional displays, but to the ideal of reason. 
It's rather like um, something similar was happening in England, of the, um, the sceptics and the humanists got together to saying, well, you know, it's all very well saying, true religion, we don't need it, but they're singing hymns and everything. It's, it's actually rather nice. So they got together and organised in churches, you know, meetings where they sang probably liberation songs and, um, you know, had speeches and lectures and things like that to get that same sort of feeling. Um, but as happens when you, you know, intellectuals start arguing, of course, for other opinions, and Robespierre um, said, no, no, we, we can't, we, we need a deistic thing, and he tried to create the church of the supreme being, a sort of a brand new church. Um, and he, he lectured the convention on the necessity of terror. He said, the foundations of a popular government in a revolution are virtue, there's the idealism, and terror. Terror without virtue is disastrous, and virtue without terror is powerless. The government of the revolution is the despotism of liberty over tyranny. This is a paradox in that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sort of a dictatorship of liberty over tyranny. Um, now, I'm using this term archetype, and I realize that it's actually a technical term that has a specific meaning. Um, so I really want to explain what I mean when I'm talking about this as a new archetype. Mm. And the analogy I'd give would be a river. You see, on the land, the rain falls more or less randomly all over the place. But water finds channels which you know, cracks in the ground and, and finds favorite channels and begins to flow down those. And they merge and they merge until you end up with a great torrent river and nearly all the water travels down to the sea along those channels. And the more the water goes that way, the deeper it gets, and the more it's trapped in those channels. And the sort of archetype I'm talking about is like that archetype in society. It's, um, that's what I mean, the revolution is something that sweeps you along. Mm. Um, you know, you may actually be sort of half-hearted about it, but you get into that channel and down you go. And you notice you don't have to. There's still the possibility of just soaking into the earth, whatever. But it's very easy to get swept around the nature of an archetype. So um, this is what I saw as revolution as something which in a sense was as old as the hills, all the elements were always there, but it was new in the way it all came together, like mm -hmm. a great river. Then, let me think, what's that, about 40 years later or something? 60 years later, is it? 13th March 1781, um, oh no, sorry, let's see. The next one was Neptune, found on 23rd September 1846. Now, nothing like as dramatic, um, because we already, you know, the, danger, the damage had already been done. We already had a new planet, you know, and now we knew there could be new planets, that sort of thing. Not so striking, and yet things happened which had a, were going to have quite a significance. This wasn't a breaking of boundaries so much as a dissolving or... Boundaries? What boundaries? Um, two things were associated with that time which happened that year. There was the rise of the spiritualist movement and the discovery of anaesthetic ether. Now, you see, um, the one thing in life you can't get away from, they always say, is death and taxes. You know, death was the ultimate definite thing where Saturn led you to, and that was the end of it. But the spiritualist movement said, ah, oh, it's just a passing over. You know, we don't use that term, it's a passing over. Going to the next phase, that sort of thing. So that sort of boundary which everyone would be frightened of, no, 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 you know, it's just a passing over. And ether, um, again, sort of from the point of view of subjective experience, probably the most sharpest distinction we can have is between pain and pleasure. Um, now, with ether, you can be in excruciating pain and you can float off into pleasure. The druggy thing. And so, the, as they say, that Neptune is a sense of um, dissolving. It's saying boundaries, what boundaries? A bit of denial about that, I'd say. Perhaps denial. Um, and. Uh, no boundaries, no blockage. The equality which was talked about here really becomes um, real when you say, well, there's no distinction between anyone. We're all equal. It's a sort of 
It's a continuation of it, taking it further. Um, but what that can lead to is a sense of dissolution mm. and decay. Because when the body dies, all the things which worked because they kept separate, the different cells, the different parts of your body, begin to decay into a uniform mush, pass away. So we have also dissolution and decay. Pluto is one that I find harder to mm. pin down because it's, we're closer to it. You know, we haven't got such a good hindsight. Um, but when it was, it, it came, it embodies reaction for me because its discovery followed on the great economic crash, you know, the Great Depression, and. Um, uh, it's mostly associated with the rise of fascism. You know, this was when um, Nazism really took over Germany. It was that point. And um, fascism was spreading through Europe. A reaction of the masses. Now, Pluto is the god of the underworld. And so this isn't a group of idealized, um, you know, idealistic intellectuals starting a revolution. It's a sort of mass reaction to what mm -hmm. happened. Um, and um, another thing that was discovered at that time, this was when nuclear fission was being developed. Now, do you see the parallel there? It's almost as though, just as the common people are like the sort of bedrock of society, the ordinary people, the bedrock of our lives is matter. Matter, the one solid, dependable thing. And it was as though we discovered that matter has in it this boiling rage, which can be released destructively. And this is what seems to be happening in society. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there's a, the sort of reaction against the freedom. There was a Hayes Motion Picture Production Code, you know, where they realized that this um, new um, cinema, this new art form, needed to be um, pinned down, you know, and so they, they made all these extraordinary rules like um, you may not see the inside of a woman's thigh, and you know you must do this, you must do that. <laughs> All the things to be done. I'm trying to sort of clamp down on this creativity which was coming out. So um, what I see here is three new archetypes in the sense they really do mean something new coming together, and they can have many faces. Here we have obviously the revolutionary, um, but also the mad scientist you know, Dr. Strange does. Um, so what if a few people die? You know, it is to find the truth. It will take mankind forward, sort of thing. You know, that's sort of thing, the mad scientist. Um, and um, for Neptune, we have the hippie. Hey, man, you know, what's the difference, man? You know, whatever. Um, and we also have the decadence, the drug addict, you know, the, um, the person who's got no boundaries and life is dissolving away. For Pluto, I say the fascists and the thug, but really it's more a mob of fascists and thugs. Um, it's about a mob thing. These are the, um, some of the faces of these new um, archetypes. And so I want to go back to Bambi in Germany and the Weimar Republic. As I said, my impression of the Weimar Republic was, you know, crappy, useless government, creates a vacuum, in comes Hitler. Actually, something happened in between that um, I had realized. Once this sort of, this newness, the revolution, you know, let's get rid of the old, let's make a fresh start, that's inspiring to people. And Germany became a magnet for artists, intellectuals, thinkers, revolutionary people, creative people. And Germany became the swinging place to be in Europe and in the world to some extent. New art forms, um, new forms of drama all broke out. Um, it was a real sort of honeymoon period. And um, it attracted people from all over the world. Berlin became the swinging place to be. And it was swinging in all senses, because with that sense of, um, well, there are no more boundaries now, and everything's equal, there was, you've got um, sexual liberty, 
um, free love. Uh, and famously, you know, in the cabarets of Berlin, you had men dressed as women and women dressed as men, you know, frightfully shocking stuff and all that. Um, and a certain amount of drug taking, breaking out, it was, it was just such a, a wild scene. And then another very Neptunian thing happened, and that was hyperinflation. Inflation is another very Neptunian word. Puffing up. And um, so those were the things that really Nazism and the fascist revolt were reacting against. It wasn't so much, we don't like the Weimar Republic, is look at this appalling world we're in. Rich people getting richer, poor people suffering, um, the, um, you know, this dissolution, these, dr these people, uh, sexual misbehavior and everything, it was disgusting to them. Um, they reacted against it. And Hitler came in with the motto, law and order. Um, and boy, people felt they needed it. Um, now, that pattern, I seem to see in a lot of revolutions. When I went back to the French Revolution, you see there wasn't the, um, uh, it was the potential for it, but I didn't see that sort of Neptunian honeymoon period. It seemed to go to violence in its own route. But if I look at the, the, this, what happened in Germany, and I look at what happened in um, Russia. Now, actually, the, uh, again, I had the idea you know, that uh, well, there was this revolution and Stalin took over. Um, and that's an oversimplified picture. And I think it's been helped by, you know, said about by propaganda, that people didn't want to see could be any success in the Russian Revolution. So, you know, they argued that uh, a revolution means Stalin. But there was actually a honeymoon period in between. I saw a documentary which, which um, illustrated this. There was a time when um, the hope that was inspired led the way. And, um, you know, not only... I mean, it wasn't just the working class against the aristocrats, because quite a lot of the aristocrats, you know, like the Tolstoyan people, actually um, sympathised, you know, they wanted change in society. And what sort of thing that happened was that um, uh, privileged students at the universities, <coughs> the class students, actually left to go to the factories and the fields in order to educate the poor people for nothing. There was, there was that spirit of um, goodwill and... Um, behind this revolution. There was women's movements, there was, um, and there was artistic, uh, new artists were attracted by this, new, looking for new forms of art. There was this honeymoon period, and then um, uh, in came uh, Stalin, and Lenin, when Lenin died, Stalin came in, and Trotsky was, um, Stalin took over, Trotsky was banished, um, who had represented some of the more liberal side of it, and, um, family were assassinated and the terror began. Now, it's tempting for me as an English person to say, we don't do that sort of thing. But actually, in my own lifetime, we did. We had our revolution. Because the Second World War, um, the hero of the people, the saviour of the people, like, was Winston Churchill, as we've seen in recent movies. You know, he was the people's hero. They all loved him. And... Um, uh, and yet, in, I think it was in 1945, certainly just at the end of the war, a general election was held, and he was ousted. And in came a socialist government. And it was a very good socialist government. Mm -hmm. I remember in the 50s the pride we felt. Britain was bombed out. You know, I'd go to Bristol and it was, or London, it was just bomb sites, bomb sites, centre blown to bits. We didn't have much money, we were still on rationing and everything. But we created a national health system, which was the pride of pride, and it was a model to the world. I remember in the 50s, you know, newspaper stories, did you hear about the woman who came from America to have her baby? Because our hospitals were free and offered much better service than anything in America. And we didn't say, go home, Yanks, we don't want you using offices. We said we were proud, you know. America would seem to have everything coming to us because we created something so good. It was a real good, um, successful socialism. And it led to um, uh, getting, breaking down some of the old stuffy institutions. 
the BBC, which they used to call Auntie, because it was um, it was, was government um, what it, uh, organization whose role was to educate the people and to bring them up with high standards of music and things like that. Auntie began to show satirical television programs in around about 1960. That was the week that was, um, you know, making fun of government and um, uh, censorship began to slip and everything. And we had the swinging 60s, uh, the Beatles. London became the artistic place everyone was flocking to. Um, movies were made. Music came pouring out. Sex, drugs and rock and roll took over. That was the Neptunian phase where anything goes. And um, it ran into problems. Early 70s, Jimi Hendrix, who was a hero musician of mine, died from drugs, um, choking on his own vomit. And um, economic crisis, we didn't do it as well as Germany. We did have inflation, not as hyperinflation though, and it was causing the government trouble. And in came the reaction. Margaret Thatcher, on the same promise as Hitler, law and order, and um, actually leading to a lot more disorder and a war. But um, that was her promise, and she swept in on that promise, law and order. Now, I now live in South Africa, and I'm aware that 1994 was a revolution. Um, you know, something which some people thought could never happen, that this um, national government um, gave way, and um, apartheid was ended, and we had the rainbow nation, and all that idealism and hope and joy. And that was before I came here, but I arrived in 2005, and already um, South Africa was earning its name as a creative place, a place where people would come, an artistic place, people coming from around the world. It's now a hub for film and TV making, and um, uh, African fashions are now sort of, uh, they're the thing in the world. Um, you know, they've replaced the Far Eastern look, and um, everyone's looking to Africa. And we've got, you know, the, um, the wonderful Museum of Modern Art in Cape Town. It's becoming, fashion tourists are coming here. Um, now, we're too close to it to see it with that same easy backward glance. But uh, there is the corruption. Um, you see, if you see no boundaries, then, and you're in charge of the, companies, the country's money, then it's your money. What's the difference? You know? um, I'm in charge, so it's my money. You know? um, whether it's a company or whether it's a government, that sort of corruption um, it begins to show, uh, and um, we're still at the stage of sort of hope and uh, artistic um, license and creativity, but there are definitely the signs cracks in that. And you can also see the signs of what could happen in terms of a plutonium reaction. You know, there's BLF, EFF, starting to point fingers. Um, See, Margaret Thatcher, um, she couldn't exactly go and blame the Jews, as Hitler had done. It was a bit too soon after. But she pointed to single mothers, these remnants of the, you know, the decadent hippie era. Um, uh, you know, that's what's wrong with society. You know, we need to turn back to old values and things like that. And you do hear these calls for a return to early values in South Africa. So I'm pointing to a sort of um, archetype, which is like revolution. Goes to dissolution through hope, through um, freedom, dissolution, to reaction. And I said, I'm using the word archetype. It says it's like a great river. That, um, we seem to sort of sweep down through these three phases. And the question is, are we forever trapped in that? Must we flow down this river? And in looking for an answer, I'm afraid I haven't got one, um, uh, I looked to Chiron, a 
planet was, to, uh, no, no, it didn't be a planet, it's a centaur, it was discovered in my own time in 1977, 1st of November, which was a very important time in my own spiritual growth. And um, as I say, by then I was a bit blasé about you know, finding new asteroids and things like that. But the interesting thing about Chiron is that when it's closest to the Sun, it's actually closer than Saturn's orbit. So it's a personal planet at that point. But when it's furthest from the Sun, it's actually outside the orbit of Uranus. So then it's a transpersonal planet. That was very interesting to me because it sort of stitches together the personal and the impersonal, the transpersonal in an interesting way. I couldn't really think what the significance was. And I sort of bought books on it and looked at it in my chart and that. And I didn't really, um, and I still don't fully know, but the, I made some progress when in the 90s um, uh, Charles Harvey was holding in Bath. Um, astrological seminars, and I used to go to those because it was close to where I lived. And um, Liz Green gave one. And in it, she talked about Chiron. And she started to talk about, this is, a, a, you know, Chiron famously was a centaur who had a wounded heel because of a dart that went into his heel. It was poisoned and would never heal. But he became a healer. And so this image of the wounded healer and I thought, ah, oh God, we've got two lots of wounds here because in about 1972 or so, I worked in London um, across the road from the Liberal Club where the Astrological Association held its meetings. And one meeting I went to was by a young woman astrologer called Liz Green talking on Saturn. And I found it absolutely inspiring. You know, Saturn came to life when she gave that talk. And a few years later, the book came out, and I, uh, I rushed to get it. Um, so, you know, the whole idea of the sort of Saturn wounds and that was, I really go for the psychological astrology of her school. Uh, but here she was talking about the Chiron wound. Now, fortunately, she went on to draw a distinction which made sense of it to me. And the distinction is between the wounds that heal and the wounds that can't. And I can't remember what an example was, so I'm just going to invent one to, to illustrate what this is. You know, a classic scenario is of a very driven person. Let's say it's a, a young sportsman who wants to be an Olympic gold medalist. And he's got a tremendous drive, tremendous ambition, he's got his sights on that. And he goes up and up and up the ladder, but always when it comes to the finals, he falters. He may even have broken the record in the heats, but when it comes to the finals, it doesn't work out. That's the sort of a pattern which is not uncommon. And the nice traditional story about that will be someone says you have a, a wound, you know, and you go to a, a consultant who talks you through, and what they discover is that his drive comes from a father who, when he was very small, said, you are going to be a top athlete, you will be a gold medalist, and drove him and drove him and put that drive into him, projected it into him. But he overdid it. And every time the boy made a mistake and didn't kick the ball right or something, the father said, you're useless, you'll never make it. And blew him up, thinking he was giving him more encouragement. And that is the wound he has inside. When he gets up to the finals, um, he falters because he also knows that he will never make it. He isn't good enough. And in this nice sort of story, what happens is that when he finds that out, when he realizes it, he can address the wound and he can heal it and then he can become the champion. Now, what you were saying, it isn't that sort of wound, Chiron. It's one that will never heal. This is the person with the same ambitions, the same desire, the same vision, but he gets polio and has a twisted leg. He'll never get there. It's not a question of just sort of, you know, feeling better about it or whatever. He'll never make it. And so, is that the end of everything? And we know, of course, it isn't, because if he can accept the reality and, for instance, turn his focus to the Paralympics, he can actually he can have the gold medal, he can have the cheering crowds, he can have that knowledge of being best, just it isn't exactly what he was wanting originally, but it is something which is very good in itself. 
So um, the message there was, you know, that uh, I think particularly in the sort of 60s and new age, the idea that, you know, you can do anything, there is no limits. You know, if you find the wound, you can heal it, you know, the world is your oyster. And Chiron was being in there to realize, you know, some things you're never going to heal. Mm. You're stuck in them and you need to look for an alternative way around. And so that was a question really, um, the question mark this talk ends with. We've got these three archetypes and we can see there's a very sort of easy evolutionary river we can flow down. Now is it the type that, um, is this a Saturnian sort of problem that we could, if we, you see, archetypes like that sometimes they're crying out to be recognized. Sometimes these wounds are actually a screaming out to be recognized. They're not trying to do you down, they're saying, see me, see me, see me. Now if we see this and prepare for it, you know, the revolutionaries with their tremendous idealism around the table, when they write their perfect new, um, I've got what's it called, you know, the, 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 the Constitution. What's, what's the word, Lydia? Manifesto. 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 No, Manifesto. I was thinking of the Constitution. Constitution. That's it. When they write their perfect Constitution, mm. can they think ahead to put in mm. some clauses mm. to anticipate that this will probably happen and just, mm. you know, in other words, with awareness, can we solve this? Or is it a question that actually is so inherent in human nature, this, this pattern? It's so sort of natural that um, we need to look for, to really rethink um, the nature of change and, uh, you know, the old model of revolution and reaction, everything may not be the thing that we need. So I leave you with a question mark. First, I just I want to say I, I can't remember enjoying a talk as much as I have this one in quite some time. Um, uh, you and I are, are thinking along very similar lines. In fact, um, by pure coincidence, in the last two weeks I've read biographies about Robespierre, Danton, and right now I'm reading about Eric Ludendorff, who was a, an important German general in the First World War, and who was who marched with Hitler in the beer pooch. Who sort of um, Long story short, we're, we're looking at a lot of the same things. Um, mm. I wanted to just point out a couple, if, if I may, if you mm. don't mind, just sort of uh, uh, additions to what you've pointed yeah, out. Please. Um, mm. Number one, um, when, uh, uh, when Herschel discovered Uranus, mm. um, of course it was, as, it was uh, as far away from the sun in, in a mm. geocentric sense. It was mm. making a station. Mm. Um, and it was that same, it was within two weeks of the United States um, becoming a legal entity with their, their first, the, the Articles of Confederation being ratified. Mm. So there's mm. something very sort of yeah. uh, um, uh, solid coming in with the two of those. Mm. And when you look at um, the stations of Uranus in people's soul returns, you get some astounding results. For instance, you mentioned Robespierre. Mm. His idea was the, the, the cult of the supreme being. Mm. And his sole return in 1794 was the day of Uranus making a direct station. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And when you go through history, you find this happens a lot over yes. and over. Yeah. That and also the, con the, the conjunction transit. Mm -hmm. Kaiser Wilhelm was in Aquarius and Uranus was conjunct his son mm -hmm. when the First World War broke out. And this is sort of, you know, the, the harbinger of mm -hmm. everything going to pieces mm -hmm. for him. Um, the, the going back to, to Uranus and the French Revolution, there really there was a honeymoon period between 1789 and 1792. Mm. Oh, yeah, it really exactly was that. a lot more sort mm. of there was a lot of hope and and yeah. and you know people were still they were talking mm. about a constitutional monarchy at that mm. time and even some of the people you mm. know even your Dantons and your Robespierre's were on board for all mm. that. So it was just a little bit later oh, that yes. things got you know, mm. uh, really messed up. Mm. Uh, there was Lavoisier, the, the, oh, the yes. chemist who yeah. identified yeah. oxygen. Mm. Uh, he wound up getting his head cut off, but he was a, an mm. important figure in that yeah. revolution. Uh, another thing that's very Iranian is flight. 
the Montgolfier brothers oh, the launched man. the first hot air balloon. Oh, yes, uh, yeah. the, the, there had been a hot air balloon launched indoors by the Portuguese mm. several decades earlier. But mm. the first time that, that human beings ever actually went into yeah. the sky in a hot air balloon... And got that helicopter view of the world yes. looking down on it. And in that fact, that. not long after, during mm. the Revolutionary War, in 1794, literally mm. days before Robespierre's head is cut off, mm. Um, the French revolutionaries went, went an important battle in Belgium, in mm. Fleurou, and they used the hot air balloon for reconnaissance. It's the first time that, yes. you know, it, it, that, that this new yeah. technology yeah. is used yes. for military. It's got that transpersonal thing, because suddenly one person can see. Can see, and yeah. 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 Um, so th yeah. that's a very, very yeah. important Uranian yeah. image to me. Yeah. It's the hot air balloon, yeah. uh, uh, really the birth of flight, and, mm. you know, uh, in, the, in the true sense. Yeah. Um, and then going to Neptune, discovered in 1846, mm. um, there's this really impressive week, the last week of January 1848. So Neptune's mm. just over a year old. Mm. Um, in this one week, a bunch of astonishing things happen that to me all mm. represent, in addition to what you pointed out about Neptune, mm. like the discovery of ether, these other things that happen. Mm. Uh, number one, is that um, right when the, the U.S. has just ended its war with Mexico, they're about to take over mm. this huge landmass that goes from California to Texas, and they're mm. going to take it away from Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's going to be part of the continental United States now. Mm. And right when they sign that treaty, that same week, mm. gold is discovered in California, and the gold rush is going to begin. Oh, yes. And this whole idea that you yeah. have in the Americas of people going out west to make their fortune, yes. you know. Anyone you know, could be rich. Anyone yeah. could be rich. Yeah. And, and mm. California is this sort of mm. ongoing land of dreams mm. and all that, that comes up. Another thing that happens mm. in the eastern... That, I just put one thing in there. Yes. I, I mean, in England... Um, uh, again, it's a smaller way, but um, the town near where I lived, Cheltenham, was one of those places they discovered a healing water mm -hmm. and it became a craze. You know, everyone had to go to a spa. It was the fashionable thing to do. And houses were knocked up very, very quickly, very cheaply, um, and there was a huge housing balloon you know, bubble. Um, which then crashed and everyone went very religious. <laughs> so, you know, that's of inflation. Thing, very much, very yeah. much. Um, another thing that happened, uh, yeah. Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. gave a speech, mm -hmm. uh, I think in, in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, about um, past, um, what we today would call nonviolent mm -hmm. resistance. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a, he gives this speech and then he turns it into a pamphlet. Mm -hmm. And this is the, this is the, the, the concept adopted mm -hmm. by, by Gandhi, mm -hmm. by, by Martin Luther King, the whole idea of fighting violence with nonviolence. Mm -hmm. with, um, this sort of, you know, mm -hmm. f fighting by doing nothing, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. Um, although, I know Gandhi didn't like the term passive resistance, <laughs> not, but that sort mm -hmm. of idea comes mm -hmm. up that same week. Another thing is in Belgium, that same week, mm -hmm. Karl Marx finishes writing the Communist Manifesto mm -hmm. that week, mm -hmm. which is the, the whole, I, you know, mm -hmm. the, need I go further. There's something yeah. about that sort of um, um, uh, collectivist idea yeah. that I think also comes, uh, comes out in Neptune. In 1848 is a year of revolutions mm -hmm. erupting all around mm -hmm. Europe. Mm. Um, and, and, but they're failed revolutions, mm. <laughs> unlike yeah. the, the, the yeah. American and French ones. Mm. None of them really go anywhere, although at yeah. the same time they're, they're far more inspirational for mm. future revolutions. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I remember the time you know, in the 60s when sort of having got the idea the world is changing everything, you know, enthusiastic groups of people got together and, you know, we're going to change the world. <laughs> but it sort of ended up smoking dope and sort of, right. yeah, man, you know, it's, it's all going to happen, isn't it? You know, <laughs> no one actually did anything. Yeah. But they, yeah. they, 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 at the same time, they kind of did change the world. Yes, because it was like a wave passing through. Yeah. No one individual really was the Yes, exactly. Thing. Just yeah. in some kind of amorphous yeah. way, things yeah. really did change a great mm. deal. Uh, anyway, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but this is a, a marvelous talk. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank, thank you. I was I was supposed to be at UAC this week, and you've made it totally worth not being there. Yeah. It's a much better talk than I would have gotten over there. So. Um, thank you very much. You have to, you have to try. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. Like filling in, you know, I just sort of seen the structure, you know.
Oh yeah, yeah, you can go on that. This is a, a, a big preoccupation of mine, so I, I, I love the, the focus. But does it make a difference, for example, with Iran is now moving retrograde? Is it going to make any difference, say, in South Africa with uh, the reaction of... I, I, this is where I'd, I'd ask the, the more official astrologers, <laughs> um, you know, uh, retrograding, certainly. Um, I, yeah, I look for the, the I look for the stations and the conjunction transits, um, yeah. uh, and and then look at the people involved politically. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there are people you can see coming a mile away because they're already holding office. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's someone who's going to uh, you know emerge out of the blue seemingly. Mm -hmm. Um, keep in mind, for instance, uh, speaking of, of Weimar Germany, mm. Hitler had a, a zero degree or two degree Taurus sun, and it's right when Uranus goes into Taurus in 1934 that he seizes absolute mm. power. He was elected in 1933, but he still serves under, he's yeah. only a chancellor, and Hindenburg yeah. is, is yeah. the top dog, but Hindenburg dies in August of 1934, mm. right when Hitler's getting that conjunction transit and that's when he that's when he becomes the Fuhrer yeah. and that's when you start to see like the big mm. you know uh, mm. rallies the you yeah. know and, and, and that's absolutely no, one to stop no one's going to stop them at no. that point yeah. um, mm. those Uranus transits are always really mm. key uh, so again I look for people who have the stations and their solar returns mm. like Robespierre in 1794 I have a whole talk mm. that I've given on this um, mm. and uh, Abraham Lincoln had mm. Uranus station as the Civil War was about to begin. Mm. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had the Uranus station in, in his sole return in 1941 when the United States would wind up in the war. Mm. Um, it, it just goes on and on. Tom Paine had Uranus making the station when he wrote Common Sense, this very important pamphlet uh, it, that he wrote in 1776 as the American mm. Revolution was coming out, and he coined the, the term United States of America. Um, so I, I can go on and on. Like if you look at the history and those these individual figures who do make an impact, mm -hmm. you can often see Uranus transits being just right out there in the open. Oh, Tsar Nicholas. I'm sorry, Tsar Nicholas mm -hmm. also had like just like his cousin Willie had the conjunction transit in 1914. Mm -hmm. Tsar Nicholas had uh, the station in his solar return. Mm -hmm. uh, I. I, I would have to check my notes, but in one of those important First World War years. You mentioned one word that I forgot to put in. Pamphleteer is another main oh, Iranian right. image, you know, person printing and printing and printing these words and, and sending them out. And Tom Paine is your, your <laughs> classic, classic yeah. example. Mm. Mm. Um, and Nick, um, I was just thinking, so we're heading towards a uh, Mars retrograde, 26th yes. of June to yes. 26th of August, something like that. And of course, it goes into Aquarius and then uh, goes retrograde, right? So yeah. it's not, it's going to be squaring Squaring Uranus, squaring right? Uranus, and then we have yeah. a Venus retrograde in Scorpio that will also square Uranus. Right. So so what are your what are your uh, just on a different topic? More or less any thoughts? There's, on that? I have so many thoughts on yeah. that. Uh, the Mars retrograde is actually what I would have been speaking about in ULAC, uh, but I'm more than happy to speak about it here. Um, mm -hmm. The, as, as Lionel mentioned, the cycle of Mars is very erratic. The transit mm -hmm. is very erratic. And um, unlike Venus, which is very symmetrical and, mm -hmm. and, and evenly distributed. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 this very mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. elegant, uh, perfect image. Mars is, is asymmetrical and mm -hmm. widely imbalanced. Uh, and the retrograde in tropical Aquarius is very rare. We haven't had a Mars retrograde in tropical, tropical Aquarius since 1971. So there are people who are in their mid-40s, and this is, you know, like for instance, uh, Chris Brennan, um, my friend, the astrologer, he has an Aquarius rising and an Aquarius moon. He was born in 1984. He's never had Mars go retrograde over his ascendant and moon ever in his life. Uh, whereas I'm a Leo rising. I've had Mars retrogrades in Leo every 15 to 17 years. I've already had it happen to me three or four times in my lifetime. And this is a, a really astonishing sort of difference when we think about horoscopes and transits and, and the way these things are distributed. Um, the Mars retrograde in Aquarius is so rare, um, but it, it often coincides with big moments in international diplomacy. And actually Russia, very often, virtually 
every important treaty ever signed by Russia uh, has occurred during this, this for instance, the, the, the pact with Hitler mm -hmm. in 1939 occurred just after, a, just as Mars was going direct in late Capricorn after it had gone retrograde like this one does in early Aquarius and back to Capricorn. Over and over and over again. So I would, I would look to them for something. Um, the other thing is I would look to, uh, um, you know, for, well, um, you know, like I said, people having um, the, the solar return, having the stations in their solar return. One of Donald Trump's sons had Uranus station in his solar return when his father got elected, but the other son is having it this year. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you also, and Donald Trump, of course, is a sun Uranus conjunction eclipse <laughs> chart kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's a major Uranian figure. Um, so you can sort of see that coming from a mile away. Um, and look at his sudden... You know, right, and, and, and his wife, his Melania, is an early Taurus. She's going to have that Uranus conjunction transit no, fairly soon. So you can certainly see a lot of stuff coming up there. Um, I have a feeling, I, I mean, it seems counterintuitive now, but Melania Trump is going to be a lot more important than we ever imagined. You know, um, that could be interesting. Um, that's about it. Sorry, Lionel, I don't mean to take over. I'm just it's a very enthusiastic uh, response. It's really, I, I mean it. Worth yeah. missing you, I hope. Wow. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. Mm. So. Any other questions? Or three? Are you looking at our country oh, yeah. in light of that? Mm. Where we are? Yeah. Are you going to look at it? Um, Unpack it or not? I, I haven't sort of got horoscopes put up or anything or talking about transits. Yeah. I'm just sort of, as I say, when I look back at these things, you can see patterns very clearly, and the further back they are, sort of, the more obvious they are. But looking at the present mm -hmm. is looking at something very, you know, you're looking at the pixels, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And um, let's say I just noticed that uh, there's, if you just look at headlines, there's plenty of evidence that this is now. A, a place which is swinging South Africa, yeah. you know, and the world is looking to us for art and inspiration, things like that. Um, and yet, you can also see um, uh, the rumblings which yes. could build uh, up. Yeah. 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 I would say we, we're heading towards the, the reactionary side, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah. certainly yeah. of certain happenings and yeah. the news as I got back. The um, Zoom are really trying to, to get that ball rolling. It, and mm -hmm. um, as I got back, there's the decolonization. Um, mm. Process the within the mm. well, the land right. stuff, but, right. but also right. they're going to, you know, the, the talks about the educational system going mm. deep, becoming decolonized. Mm. So, you know, it's it's going to be yes. um, announced in the next week or so. Yeah, I, I know um, Anna's twins were in high school. They're they're hearing a lot about the decolonization yes. of education. So yes. it's something that's really it's it's definitely uh, happening because you know yeah. I heard it on the news. It's going to be announced yeah. on one of these big like national yeah. days or something like that. So they're having talks and yeah. so it's happening. So I think it's, we we're definitely swinging from the yeah. from the Neptunian phase yeah. towards the oh, reactionary yeah, phase. Yeah, it's like yeah. stuff starting to finger pointing is a very Finger Actually, pointing, phase, you know, yep. Margaret Thatcher was, it was um, single mothers, you know, and it was the Jews or the gypsies, whatever. And, um, uh, you know, they're pointing at colonialism, white cap monopoly capital, yeah. these things. Um, well, just the way those yeah. with money, and so, yeah, it's like, mm. you know... Um, well, it's an imbalance, so, isn't it? It's, it's an imbalance. It needs to be right. And it's yeah. everywhere. And exactly. It's everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that reaction is to kind of just like, okay, well, let's sit with with not being in the bubble. So mm. let's let's, um, but it's not working, mm. and the reaction's happening to <coughs> sort to sort it out. Well, it's yeah. a government not taking blame but finding people to blame. Yes. Lynn, you, you well, I'm just wondering if we've gone through a failed reactionary phase with Zuma because that's where he definitely was. Mm. And um, maybe we're switching back into the um, Uranus yes. phase. Yes. It really depends yes. on, I think it's, yeah. it's, it's very mm. wobbly at the moment. Yeah. 
Well, we still and have an activation of the Uranus square Pluto. It's the last in this year of them actually kind of being within five degrees of each other now mm -hmm. from 2012. So we're really still mm -hmm. at the latter end of the Uranus yeah. Pluto square. Right, and that was a revolution that started at the other tip of Africa and is sort of working its way to this one. Well, exactly, right? It started in Egypt. And yeah. Yeah. When I talked about, you know, the, as it were, the, um, the healing, Thing where you know becoming aware can actually be what heals it. You know, like my, my first example, the Saturnian example. Now you see the fact that um, people are seeing this pattern. It may be um, this is being optimistic. You know that um, uh, that Ramaphosa knows the danger of this mm -hmm. and is trying to sort of, you know, that's the thing we mustn't allow to happen sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. is, as it says, you know, it's trying to sort of go back to a revolution which um, <laughs> you want. Yeah, bringing um, those, reacting, bringing those changes in, it's, it's mm -hmm. what is needed. Yes. It's, you know, uh, and because if it's, if it's not done in, mm -hmm. by some kind of process, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a press. It's, it's, it's a suppress, okay, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. like anything. If if that if that need is suppressed, then mm. you know you cause um, a reaction. It explodes. Mm -hmm. um, out of interest, do you think that maybe it's just a timing thing, an evolutionary thing for us, because it's all depending on the aspects as well that these planets, these transpersonal planets, mm. are making to each other, and perhaps it's really out of our hands to a certain extent. It's the nature of humanity's evolution to go through these mm. these birth these these painful yes. birthing periods to yes. we evolve where they start making trines or easier aspects. Mm. I don't know. Something similar to you go through mm. birth, childhood, yeah. puberty. It's like it's a natural process of life. Whether we exactly. like it or not, yeah. you know what I mean? Whether yeah. it's destructive yeah. or not, but that there is something out of our mm. hands about the experience. That's what I was trying to convey in my sort of river analogy. So this this has got a beautiful inevitability about it, you know, they, they, they get growing old and that sort of thing and, and it's all and um, uh, that nice. has got a logic to it, hasn't it? You know, yeah. you you break an old thing um, that gives freedom, um, which is inspiring, um, but some people don't know how to handle freedom and they go too far and then other people are disgusted, you know, it's got a sort of a logic to it. So it's not a thing which is strange when you look at it, you think, well, I can see why that happens. Well, it's, it's natural in that sense. Mm -hmm. But to what extent are we caught with this natural? You know, is that just the way we evolve? Or to what extent can we do something about it or find an alternative? And the, there is the, 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 the mythological relationship between Uranus and Saturn is sort of overt and obvious. Yes. It's something that did happen Mm -hmm. um, it, the, the most Saturnian response to revolution mm -hmm. manifests very uh, uh, distinctly in the French and Re Russian revolutions, mm -hmm. whereby most of the figures involved were devoured by the revolution, which is a very Saturnian yeah. Saturn yeah. eating his children. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I mean, the, like I said, reading these biographies of Robespierre and Danton, the way everyone who was a leading figure, pretty much, of mm -hmm. the French Revolution wound up getting their head chopped off one yeah. after the other. And then Stalin is virtually the mm -hmm. only survivor yes. of, the, of the Soviet Revolution because he had, you know, everyone... He uh, chopped yeah. <laughs> That's a <Texas laughs> revolution. Yeah. Trotsky was a real revolution. Yeah, exactly. Against yeah. the Uranian uh, Saturnian, right? Like oh, it's so, it's you amazing. know, and very, very obviously so. Mm. Um, and then in the, the American Revolution, it's, it doesn't quite happen like that. I mean, the revolutionaries get to keep their power. Mm. But they, they don't really, you know, these are a bunch of white slave-owning guys who mm. declare freedom for themselves and don't really realize, mm. you know, ultimately these principles that they're setting forth mm. um, is going to, if not rob them of, of their, of, mm. of their uh, material wealth, mm. um, is going to do something in the long run. Mm in terms of transforming their country. Lynn was reading a book which was about those and founding fathers, wasn't it, and how actually, when you look at the history of it, that book, um, how self-serving it was, some of the things they did. Mm. Oh, yeah. Is that right? mm. yes. but, but isn't this interesting because, because I think what is busy happening currently as well is, is related changes in the world currently is not related to just our last 
45 years, it's got these long-term ramifications. It's from colonization. It's yes. from slavery. It's from mm -hmm. this, what we feel yeah. now is stuff almost yeah. wanting, needing a correction from very, very long time ago. Mm -hmm. An this aspect is, that's evolved. An aspect that's evolved. This is not just, you know, last 45 years or last mm -hmm. year. This is, this, this comes mm -hmm. from... Oh, yeah. Long so one could look at a bigger be, picture revolution of this pattern. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It can be a sort of myth of a golden age driving these revolutions sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Before mm -hmm. all that happened, pointing the fingers. Oh, right. then, you know, yeah. that, that was, uh, the, the Americans and the French are both obsessed with Rome, with ancient Rome, mm -hmm. during their revolutions. Mm -hmm. All those scholars, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. are, yeah. in, in both cases, are trying to rebuild Rome, the mm -hmm. Republic of Rome. Yeah. Uh, and then the Soviets are totally obsessed with the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. They look Everything that happens in their revolution, they look to the French Revolution yeah. as a parallel. Yeah. So there's always this sort of like, yeah, we're doing something over again. We're reclaiming mm. a golden age. Yeah. You, it's 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 rife the the, the, the references to the mm. way past. back, yeah. Yeah. Way yeah. Back. yeah, yeah. An example of what you've shown us on the board yeah. of a country that has changed from reaction. Do they go back again to revolution? Mm. Oh. In cycles. Uh, in cycles. Is this a right. cycle? Yeah. And well, China, China, China did that. Yes. Uh, China I was thinking did of, um, that. Yes, you might say it's under continuing revolution. Mm. I, you know, I haven't studied that example, but I think perhaps he saw this problem and said, can we keep having new revolutions mm. and not get into, you know, the decadence, corruption, and the reaction, sort of, you know, mass uprising? I think possibly that was what he was trying. Keep inventing new another revolution. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the revolution stage. Yes, that's it. Oh, you know, sort yeah. of um, it, it, rather than just flow down that river. Can you keep the stuff circulating here? Right. But um, he was yeah. responding in many ways to when, when Stalin died in 1953, um, yeah. and which is only about three and a half years after mm -hmm. communist China became a thing, mm. and. When Khrushchev took over and started denouncing Stalin and introducing reforms, mm. Mao was responding to that. So, wait a minute, we can't start oh, yes. doing this. Yeah. Mao, in many ways, was more of a Stalinist than any of mm. the Soviets were after yeah. Stalin. Mm. Um, so it, even his, his attempt to try to perpetuate revolution is a reaction to, to, what, to how the Soviet Union yes. appears oh, to be yes. changing yes. in front of them. Yes. Mm. Fabulous discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.